guys, it's Bella and welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing another mystery video for my 12 days of Christmas. I really hope that you guys have been loving these so far and if you have then please make sure to give this video a thumbs up for me and let's just go ahead and get into this case and today we're going to be talking about the American Diet Love Pass which they call it that obviously because it's similar to the Diet Love Pass incident which I've actually done a video so if you do want to hear a little bit more about that I'll link it down below for you guys. So on February 24th in 1978, five men from Yuba County, which is in California, Jack Hewitt, Gary Mathias, William Sterling, Jack Madruga, and Theodore Weyer were all between the ages of 24 and 30. 32, sorry. So three of the men had developmental disabilities, and one of the men, Gary Mathias, he actually had schizophrenia, but he was on medication for it. He'd been on medication for it for about two to three years, and it seemed to really be helping him. He had to take it twice a day, and when he was on his medication, everything seemed fine. He didn't seem to experience the symptoms of schizophrenia. But when he didn't take it, he would start talking to himself and he just would kind of be in rough shape. His dad described it as him going haywire when he didn't take his pills. And he was also an army veteran. Jack Madruga was also an army vet and he was described as slow, but he didn't have any like diagnosed developmental issues. So all of the men lived at home with their parents and they also played basketball together for a rec league for the Yuba City Vocational Rehabilitation Center for the Handicapped. And they were actually meant to have a game on the 25th of February and it was meant to be a pretty big game. Like Wyatt asked his mum to wash his shoes for him and he was like just bugging her because it was like all he would talk about just non-stop was this basketball game. But the reason they were excited is because whoever won this game would get a free trip for a week to LA. So they were very like stoked about this. So I thought I would just tell you guys a little bit about them, what they were like, what they looked like, um, and... I'll start with Theodore Weyer. He had brown hair, he had brown curly eyes, he had a beer belly. Um, some people said that he was a handsome fella. And he was super trusting, but in like a child's way. So he would stand out and wave to strangers on the side of the road. And then he would get upset for like hours at a time if they didn't wave back at him. He loved to call Bill Sterling. He also loved to read the newspaper and the phone book to find like people with funny names, I guess. He also worked as a janitor and at a snack bar as a clerk, but he had to quit his jobs because his parents just thought that that would be best because they thought that he was disruptive. Jackie Hewitt was 24 and he loved Weya because Weya was like his protective older brother, I guess. He would always look after him, he would dial the phone for him and so Jackie was kind of like his shadow. So Jack Madruga, he was an army veteran as I mentioned and he had dark hair, brown eyes. He also worked at a place called Sunsweet Grower until he was fired in November previously, which was just like five or so months before, four months before I think. William Sterling had dark hair and blue eyes and he was extremely close to Madruga and he also was very deeply religious. Oftentimes he would go to like mental institutions and he would read like literature to them to help them believe in God or not to help them believe in God I don't think. I think he was trying to educate them about Jesus and religion. And oh it just got really dark right now. Hello. It's a bit overcast and I'm using natural light so I feel like this is going to fluctuate a lot in the way that my lighting looks. Anyway, Gary Mathias had brown hair, he had hazel eyes, he also worked for his stepfather's gardening business and he was an army vet with psychiatric discharge because of a drug problem that happened about five years earlier or because of his schizophrenia, I think. So on the 24th of February, they were going from Yuba County to a place called Chico, which was 50 miles or about an 80 kilometer drive away. 
and they were going to the University of Chico to watch a basketball game where they were supporting the away team UC Davis. So it definitely wasn't somewhere that they were familiar with. I mean, it was literally over an hour's drive away um, and they didn't really leave their houses much at all. Like they were all pretty much homebodies, never really went and did anything. Um, but they went there in Jack Madruga's car, which was a 1969 turquoise and white Mercury Montenegro. The game finished at around 10 p.m. and the team that they were there to support one so they went back to their car and started to head home and they stopped about three blocks away at a place called Burr's and the clerk remembers this because they came in really close to when it was meant to close so she was kind of annoyed because they went in bought all of this stuff they bought a hostess cherry pie lemon pie a Snickers bar a bar called a marathon bar they also bought two like things of coke and some milk. Then they went back to the car and started driving south, but they never made it home. The next morning, Ted Weir's mother Imogen woke up at around 5 a.m. She went to go and check Ted's bed, but he wasn't there. So she called Janita, who was Bill Sterling's mother, and she also said that Bill wasn't there either. She said she'd been up since two, she hadn't heard from him at all, and so all of the mothers kind of contacted each other, found out that none of the boys returned home. So by 8pm, Mrs. Madruga called the Sheriff's Department and then they started searching for them the next day. Now, a few days later on the 27th or the 28th, a forest ranger found Jack's car and it was abandoned on a gravel road near Orville in a camping area in the Plumas National Forest which was about two and a half hours from Chico and it was like the opposite direction from Chico so they drove 80 kilometers out to Chico and then from Chico they further drove another two and a half hours away from their homes. So the site that the car was found was at an elevation of 4,500 feet. So they had driven up like this dingy road up a mountain and they were parked like or the place where the car was found was right before a snow line. So you, when you get up to a certain altitude, it starts snowing because it's always cold. And there was like a snow line just a couple of meters in front of where their car was found. So the sheriff reported that there was no sign of foul play, the car wasn't damaged, um, but the keys were missing and the back passenger window was rolled down, which was really weird considering it was literally freezing. Like they were right behind a snow line. It was February, so it was like winter, um, and the car was also left unlocked. There was also about a quarter of a tank of fuel left, and on top of that, it wasn't stark and there was nothing wrong with the car because when the sheriff's department like tried to hotwire it, it started up immediately, just fine with no problems. Now inside the car they found all of the food wrappers from the things that they had gotten at Burr's, our bears, and they also found some basketball programs which showed that they had actually gone to the game in Chico like they said they would. They also found four maps that were folded up inside of the glove box and these didn't look like they had been touched, it didn't look like they were using them, which kind of made it look like they weren't lost or something. Um, because you think if you were lost that you would get that out, you know, this was a long time ago, there wasn't any GPS or anything. Like, remember when you had to like look at the directory for your mom? Like, I always used to have to get into the like directory that every single car had to like tell my parents where to go and I was terrible at it. Like my parents would have to pull over on the side of the road and have a look themselves because I was useless. Now, immediately when they found the car, Madruga's mom thought this was super sketchy because he, first of all, would never let anyone drive his car. He was only one of two men. Matthias also had a driver's license, but they were the only two that had driver's license. And he also hated camping and hated cold weather. So not only did he drive up into the mountains where it was getting colder and there was snow, but also the back windows were down. He didn't know the, the road or the place, the area at all. Um, you know, it was so far away. It was like three to four hours away from his home. And that was pretty crazy. The fact that he didn't know these roads and he wasn't looking at the map, but also the fact that the car wasn't damaged. There were no mud stains, there were no dents. And this was like a super bumpy, like gravel road. Like the sheriff actually said that he would, or whoever was driving the car would either have to be super careful and super precise 
or they would have had to know the road really well. Now this is obviously super weird because nobody knew the road as far as anybody could tell. The only person who had been even like remotely close to the area was Bill and he used to like not used to he went one time like years and years and years ago when he was a kid with his dad to go like camping they stayed in the cabin that was kind of close but not really it was just kind of in a nearby area and he hated it and he never went back most of the men as i said didn't even like leaving their houses all matthias was the only one who occasionally left his house to go and see some friends that was it the rest of them just preferred to stay at home so after finding their car they was a five day search but the problem was on the first day of the search so the day the car was found there was a massive blizzard and there was literally like two meters worth of snow that fell so it would have covered any tracks any sort of evidence that there could have been of the men being there or walking or whatever um, and also the snow was so bad that ten of the men who were searching for them almost died because their snow cat got stuck in like this massive drift of snow but the search didn't turn up any clues any signs nothing so they started putting up posters and they started questioning people around the town to see if anyone had seen anything anybody knew or could give any sort of information now a 55 year old guy named joseph shons apparently saw the car between 11 and 12 p.m because he was on the same road that the car was found abandoned on so he said that at about 5 30 p.m he took his little vw buggy up the mountain which is brave um, considering the conditions and he was going to check on like a cabin so that he could go and take his family on there on the weekend he wanted to see if it was okay if it was snowed in and like what the kind of conditions were at the time so when he got up past the snow line his car actually got stuck in the snow um, so he tried to get out and he was trying to push it out of the snow which is when he suffered from a heart attack which his doctor actually confirmed he did suffer from a minor heart attack so he kind of got back into his car and turned the heater on and just like laid down in the back seat then at around 11 p.m he saw two sets of headlights coming from him one was a car and one was a pickup truck so he got up he got outside he was trying to wave to them and called to them and they stopped literally like five meters from him he said that he saw about five men and they got into the pickup truck and they all left together anyway he said that he had a heart attack so he could have been like kind of imagining things but now here's where it gets a little confusing it's not really confusing but the article saying that came out six months after the incident happened but the article I'm about to tell you about came out the week that it happened and in this article that happened that came out the week that this all happened it said that he was lying in the back of the car when he heard a whistling noise so he got out to see what it was which is when he saw five men a woman and a baby or I don't know if he said five men but he saw he said he saw a group of men a woman and a baby and that they were walking like in the glare of the headlights he could see them so he yelled at them for help and then like he could hear them talking and then all of a sudden the lights went out and he couldn't hear them talking anymore. So he got back in his car and then he said that he saw some flashlights beaming. So he yelled for help, but then the flashlights went away. Those lights went away as well. So what I think happened, and you guys will probably see this like as we get into some more information as well. I think that like he may have changed his story in that six months or maybe like after he kind of recovered more from his heart attack he realized what he had seen or I don't know what the case may be but I mean it could have been a case of misreporting um but yeah I feel like he just changed his story once he realized what was going on or realized what he saw when somebody came back to question him about it again so whatever the case may be with that part the next part is what he claims definitely happened and this stayed the same in every time that he reported this so he said that he stayed in the back of the car until it ran out of fuel then he got out of the car and he walked down the mountain 12 kilometers like this guy just had a heart attack and now he's walking 12 kilometers 
down the mountain to a lodge and he got a beer at this lodge and then he walked back up to his car and on the way back up to his car he saw the car that had been abandoned, Jack Madura's car and he was absolutely certain that he saw this car and he also said that when he was walking back up and noticed the car he also noticed it when he was on his 12 kilometer walk down the mountain towards the lodge but he just didn't take much notice of it because it was just a car on the road it was when he walked back that he was like okay this car has been here a while something's up and then he took notice of it. Now another woman also claims to have seen five men in a red pickup truck both on Saturday and Sunday and this was about an hour away from where the abandoned car was found in Brownsville. So it was kind of like a neighboring town but the way in which you had to drive there made it a lot longer because, you know, these are like the mountains, they're windy roads, and so it took um, about an hour to drive to Brownsville from where the car was found abandoned. Now, she owned a little store there, and she said that two of the men came in to buy food, one of the men used a payphone, which was just outside of the store, and then the other two men stayed inside the car and apparently there were also a few other witnesses who had seen them in Brownsville. So a few months later, like three or so, or just over three months on the 4th of June, a group of motorcyclists pulled into a deserted forest service trailer which was at the end of a road and when they got there they said that it smelt really bad. Like it was just the most disgusting smell ever and it was a bit weird like it smelled like there was a dead body or something there so they called the police and when the police got there they went into the trailer and this was like a 60 foot long trailer they found Ted Weir inside stretched out on the floor he had eight sheets over him like covering his entire body over behind his head tucked in underneath his feet and his shoes had been removed as well he was wearing these like leather leather loafer shoes and they had been removed and they were nowhere to be found. Now, next to the bed that he was stretched out on, there was like a little table and on the table was a ring. It was his ring, it had Ted engraved on it. It was also his necklace. And then there was a watch there, it was a gold watch. The crystals from the watch were missing, but the watch didn't belong to any of the five men. Um, and they also found his wallet, which had all of his money in it. So he was tall and he was also about 90 kilos on February 24th when he left. But when they found his body, he was between 40 and 50 kilos and his feet were completely frostbitten. They were gangrene and his beard growth showed that he had likely been alive between 8 to 13 weeks by the time that they had found him and that he had starved to death. Now, what was really sketchy about this is because the trailer like place that they were at had a whole bunch of sheds around and one shed in particular, um, a bunch of the sheds had like food and blankets and warm clothes and he was found in just a t-shirt and some really lightweight pants, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So this specific shed had food, like cans of food, and they had enough rations for an entire year. And what was weird about this is that 36 of them had been eaten and they'd been opened with like an army can opener. So only like um, Mafias and Madrugas would have known how to open it considering they were the ones from the army. Um, and so this was just sketchy for so many reasons. The fact that first of all, he sat in there for eight to 13 weeks starving to death when 36 of these like cans had been opened and eaten and it just doesn't make sense. There were so many left over that he could have eaten. There was also another shed that had dehydrated Mexican dinners, it had fruit cocktails and it had a whole bunch of other snacks. And there were enough meals in this other one with the Mexican dehydrated dinners 
to keep all five men alive for a whole year. But that one was completely unopened and completely untouched. No one had touched the propane tank, which was just outside either, which is, it's just like a weird situation because if they got into this place to find this food and open this food, you think they would have looked around a little bit. The propane tank definitely wouldn't have been hard to find and all they had to do was switch it on and they would have a cooking top, they would have heat. Oh my goodness. Okay, I really apologize for the audio in that previous clip because I just realized that my microphone hasn't been recording. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that is so annoying. So anyway, this like trailer was about 19.4 miles, which is 31 kilometers away from the abandoned car. And what's weird about this is, like I mentioned, he was just wearing a t-shirt and lightweight pants. So you have to think, how did he get there? Like, did he walk in this freezing cold weather in hardly any clothes? And if he did, first of all, how long would that take to walk 31 kilometers? Second of all, he didn't know this area. He had no idea where he was going. He wouldn't have known that this trailer was there. So it was just a really weird situation. You have to think like maybe did somebody pick them up and take them like the pickup truck that, um, you know, the man said that he saw when he was driving his buggy up there or the woman in brownsville also said that she saw a pickup truck so did they have something to do with it like it is so sketchy and on top of this the trailer is like up a mountain so if you were lost why would you go up a mountain instead of down the mountain because down the mountain is where more people are going to be and more things are gonna be, it just doesn't make sense if you're lost to go up. The trailer was locked and it had been broken into through a window and another really sketchy thing is that nobody tried to start a fire and there were like matches all around, like literally on the floor so they could have seen them and there were paperback books, there were was wooden furniture, there was like all of these things that they could have used to try and make a fire and they didn't. And there was also like warm jackets and blankets and all of these things that could have kept them warm that were untouched as well. So they started looking around and at this point it was a little bit easier because all of the snow had melted, it was June, and the very next day they found Sterling and Madruga. Now they were on the opposite side of the road to the trailer but this road is like super long it's a really long road so they were about 10 kilometers away from the trailer and about 20 kilometers away from the abandoned car or about 12 miles Madruga had been partially eaten by animals and they had dragged him three meters down to a stream and he was found like lying face up on his back his uh, hand was clutching onto his watch and Sterling his bones were found only his bones and not even even all of his bones. It was most of his bones but it wasn't all of his bones and they were found just scattered around like a 15 meter area. Two days later on the same road but a little bit closer to the tra trailer Jack Hewitt's father found his son's backbone. There were a few of his bones found but they were in a much larger radius and they were few and far between. They really didn't find all that much of him um, but they did find his Levi's and his tennis shoes. The next day his skull was found about 90 meters away from his bones and they used the teeth from the skull to positively identify him as Jack Hewitt. Then about 400 meters away from where they found his body they found three like wool jackets and a flashlight that was rusty they don't know how long that it had been there and it had been turned off. Now, Gary Matthias was nowhere to be found. They didn't find a single trace of him except for his shoes, which were back in the trailer that where Weyer's body was found. So they think that because Weyer had bigger feet than him, he had taken his shoes off because his shoes were swelling from frostbite and he had put Weyer's shoes on instead and then no one knows where after that. Now, Matthias, if you guys remember, is the man with schizophrenia and he had to take two pills a day but the problem was he didn't bring any pills with him that night because he thought that he was going to be going home. They put out a description of him to state mental institutions. They said that he had dark hair, blue eyes and 
that he had double vision when he didn't have his glasses and when his dad was searching for him that's like what he was searching for he's like you know animals could eat him but they're not going to eat his glasses but nobody ever found his glasses when he left for the game as well he didn't have any identification on him um and if he was still alive then he wouldn't have had any medication and apparently when he didn't take his medication for a few days he would start to talk to himself and he would fall into a disorientated psychosis and his dad as I explained meant like explained this saying that he was going haywire. Now he has never been found there's never been any sort of sign of him and I just wonder what happened. This case honestly has me so freaking curious. Like no case intrigues me quite like this one. I just would love to know why. Just why they were even there in the first place because they were three to four hours away from their house and they were randomly drove over two and a half hours away from Chico where the game was for absolutely no reason. They don't like being away from home. They don't know that area. And I don't know, like nobody else would have been able to fit in the car. Like they had five men in this car. So it wouldn't make sense that somebody got in there and tried to hijack them and bring them up, but they had to have gone in their car because that's where their car was found abandoned. Like it is so confusing to me why did they get out of the car when it had a quarter a tank of fuel it had it was working just fine it wasn't stuck they had the window down for some reason even though it was literally freezing cold and then somehow they got from the car 30 kilometers away to a trailer and then at the trailer there's all this food and he starved to death for 8 to 13 weeks and they didn't start a fire they it just literally like boggles my mind. I want to know so badly what happened. I want to know so badly where Gary is and what happened afterwards. Like they never found his body and he was never seen. But you think if, you know, he got away somehow that somebody would have found him and reported it or something. I don't know. I don't know, man. This one confuses me. And... I just wish that I knew what happened and I would love to hear your theories on the case, your thoughts on the case, um, but that is all that I have for you guys today. I really hope you enjoy this video and hopefully I will see you next time. Bye guys!